we're okay, neighborhood gone. I got that text message from my Forest Lake neighbor, and I had no idea what it meant. What was she saying? Had a tree fallen on the house? I knew that my husband and our neighbors had gone to the basement of our home after the latest tornado warning. Those warnings were annoyingly frequent in recent weeks, and it was always a false alarm. I was on campus writing final exams when I heard the sirens and dutifully made my way to the basement of Alston Hall. I remember thinking, oh, what a pain. Now I'll have to stay late to finish those exams once we get the all clear. And then I got that message. We're okay. Neighborhood, gone. In less than one minute, our lives, mine and my neighbors, were turned upside down by a violent storm, a tornado that destroyed 12% of the city of Tuscaloosa. I didn't have a place to sleep. I didn't have a toothbrush or a change of clothes or anything to eat. And there were a million things to do all at once. My husband and I need a place to live. We should try to save what we can from the house. Then we'll need a storage unit to put everything in. I should let my folks know I'm OK. And I still have those exams to write. So many times in the past, I've seen a story of a community struck by a disaster, an earthquake in India, a hurricane on the Gulf Coast, or fires in California and thought to myself, oh, those poor people. I feel so sorry for them. And then I'd turn back to my Cheerios and I wouldn't think about it again. Even when a story of tragedy captures our attention for a few days and we open our hearts and our wallets to help, eventually we tire of the story and we move on. It never occurred to me that those who are directly impacted can't move on. I always thought they cleaned up the mess and bought new things, rebuilt, and carried on as before. And nothing could be further from the truth. I learned from the questions I got from people outside the disaster zone that they too thought things were back to normal for me pretty quickly after the storm because they had moved on. The tornado that changed my life struck on a Wednesday. And on Sunday, SEAL Team 6 killed Osama bin Laden. And there it was, the new big story. And so everyone else moved on. Tonight I want to share with you a story of how one neighborhood worked toward recovery in the weeks and months and even years following the storm. How did we move on? And to do that, I'll address three comments that I heard often in those days. What's taking so long? And what are you going to do about it? And it's just stuff. So why does it take so long? That's a good question. The recovery has been more challenging and taken more time than I could have imagined on that day four years ago. Standing in my driveway the morning after the storm, I never dreamed I would be displaced from my home for almost two years. So what took so long? Well, first things first, call the insurance company. We all know the drill because we've seen those TV commercials, right? On TV, the insurance guy shows up at your door while the winds are still blowing or the embers from the fire are still smoldering and says, I'm here to help. So. On April 28, I called my insurance company. Oh, Mrs. Parsons, we are so sorry for your loss. Of course we'll send some run right away. How's May 10? May 10? That's almost two weeks from now. Two weeks? But of course it's going to take a while. The insurance company is getting hundreds of calls all at once and trying to hire dozens of temporary workers to help with the rush of new claims. So it's going to be two weeks before I can really get started. Another much bigger factor, in a widespread disaster, 
you don't just lose a house. You lose a neighborhood, a community, your favorite restaurant, deli, or breakfast spot, your dry cleaner, and your gas station, your church, and your ATM. They're all gone. Electric power and gas lines, cable and phone service, trees that provided shade and beauty, gone. But the hardest part, it's a diaspora. The people who have been a part of your daily life for years, neighbors and friends, are suddenly scattered in every direction as they seek temporary shelter. Is the people of Forest Lake contemplated how they would move on, they wondered what the neighborhood would be like if they chose to return. For some people, rebuilding and returning to the neighborhood wasn't really an option. They were too old or they were renters. But for many, they were just scared. When my neighbors and I looked around, what we saw in front of us was just ugly. There were no businesses and no trees, just wounded houses. Would the businesses come back? How many people would return? How long would we live in a scarred landscape? So, um, communication was difficult. There were no phone lines and cell service was limited. But the rumor mill, it was alive and well. We heard that developers were buying up property and would build big apartment buildings or commercial businesses in what had been a quiet family neighborhood. We also heard that properties that held single family houses would be rezoned for hotels or big box stores or parking garages. And that's a bit about why it takes so long. The next question is, what are you gonna do about it? So, 10 days after the storm, the Neighborhood Association Board met to, to discuss what we could do about the very real concerns that our neighbors had. Before the storm, the big issues for us were things like recycling, front yard parking, and the occasional late night party that was too loud and disturbed the neighbors. Now, we were in uncharted territory. How could we alleviate fear? How could we discourage the developers who were blanketing the neighborhood with offers to buy property as is? And how could we encourage people to return to the neighborhood and build back? And from that first meeting, the We Are Coming Back campaign was born. Though our neighbors were spread far and wide, we sent the message that Forest Lake would eventually be beautiful again. Property would not be rezoned to drive out families. Commercial developers would not take over. And those who returned would not be alone. They would be part of a community, a neighborhood. So how did we do it? Well, it wasn't easy. First, we needed a way to communicate. And so we created a Facebook page for sharing information. And then we printed t-shirts, hundreds of them, that said, we are coming back. And we gave them away for free. We asked people to photograph themselves wearing those t-shirts at work, around Tuscaloosa, even out of town and to send us those photographs. We posted dozens of these pictures on our Facebook page. Soon, businesses near the neighborhood, a deli, a hardware store, and a barbecue joint began to offer discounts to anyone who came in wearing one of our t-shirts. Next, volunteers began to collect old canvases and to paint banners in bright, beautiful colors that said, we are coming back. And we hung those banners on damaged houses or on posts planted in empty lots. 
A local artist organized an effort to install beautiful photos and paintings throughout the disaster zone in a project she called Beauty Amid Destruction. Later, as flowers began to sprout in abandoned yards, as houses were repaired or rebuilt, as the first moving vans brought people back into the neighborhood, we shared photos of the progress and shared personal stories. And finally, a nursery gave away free trees so that we could reforest Forest Lake. We sent the message to those who had lost so much that their lives and their community would be beautiful again. And the campaign worked. Final thing that I heard too frequently in those days it's just stuff. These words were meant to comfort. It's just stuff, and stuff can be replaced. Look, I'm an accountant. I think in equations. So I'm going to share two equations with you to explain what I mean. When friends and strangers said to me, it's just stuff, what they meant was, people are greater than stuff. And I agree, because it's true. My neighbors and I are lucky and thankful to be alive. 53 people in Tuscaloosa lost their lives the day of that storm, and I am grateful to have survived. But what It's Just Stuff fails to recognize is stuff is greater than zero. <laughs> Many things can be replaced. But my neighbors and I all lost things that are irreplaceable, and we mourn the loss of those things. Let me give you one example, a bed. In 1940, when my grandparents married and started their life together, they bought a used iron bed. In 1944, my grandmother lay in that bed with her new baby girl, my mother. In the 1950s, my teenaged mother and her girlfriend sat on that bed as they giggled and talked about boys and planned their futures. Later, in the 1970s, my teenage girlfriends and I sat on that same bed as we, too, giggled and talked about boys and planned our futures. I took that bed with me when I left home and started my adult life. And on the day of that storm, I forever lost that bed. That bed, to me, is not just stuff. Is more evidence that stuff is greater than zero. Let me tell you how people reached out to me in the days and weeks that followed the storm. They showed their concern and tried to help by giving me stuff. The stuff they knew I needed. Moving boxes for the things that I could save from the rubble. Sunscreen to protect me as I worked outdoors with no shade a gift basket from my work colleagues filled with toiletries and snacks, a blanket, and even a few cigars. <laughs> a sports bra so that I could continue my exercise routine. Donated clothing from a church. Homemade cookies. Cash. Gift cards. All of these things, this stuff, they were expressions of love or acts of kindness to a stranger. And receiving these things, experiencing this kindness, it was just perfect. So you've heard what it's like to experience a pretty overwhelming event. And based on that experience, I'd like to leave you with these words of advice. Number one, hug your loved ones every day. Number two, take pictures of everything you own. I mean it. Open every drawer, every cabinet, every closet, and snap a picture. And finally, keep red wine on hand. <laughs> when the power goes out, it doesn't need to be chilled. Thank you.